So I, I want to start us off uh, real quick with a poll. So I'm curious to see, um, you know, what type of gardening you're doing this year. Um, and it's multiple choice. So if there's multiple styles of gardening, go ahead and select multiple. And then how long you've been gardening. Um, so I'll go ahead and launch that poll now and I'll give it about a minute or so. Okay, got about two more people, one more person. And if you can't figure out the polling feature, not a problem. Give it one more second. All right, and so all these polls are anonymous, by the way, so I don't know who's saying what. Um, so as we go along, if I have more poll questions, don't worry about it. You know, as like I said, we're recording this, um, but I want to share the results. So it's kind of neat. Um, so we have, you know, at least eight folks doing container and in ground, a few doing raised beds, um, and even one person doing straw bale gardening, which I think that's pretty neat. Uh, so you actually might probably know more about straw bale than what I do, uh, which is exciting because like it's, it's a venture that eventually I want to get into. Um, I definitely have publications on it. So and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. Um, and then quite a few, you know, a few new gardeners and then quite a few that have been doing it um, for quite a while. So welcome. I appreciate you coming. Uh, so I'm going to just breeze past the next slide because that's my introduction and since I already introduced myself. Um, but for the folks that are going to be watching this later, I'm Caitlin Davis. I'm the agriculture educator for La Crosse County. So our agenda for the hour. Now I know this seems like a lot of stuff and it probably is going to be a lot of stuff. So if for some reason I'm going too fast, feel free to, you know, ask questions in the chat box or ask me to repeat things as we go along. Uh, but we'll discuss, you know, different types of gardening that are out there. Talk a little bit about soil. I'll briefly mention fertilizer in the regards to soil. Um, we'll talk a bit about diseases and identifying them. Uh, looking at some pests, and when I mean pests here, I'm specifically talking about insects in that section. And then we'll look at weeds, and at the very end, we'll be able to answer some of your questions. Um, and if I don't get to your question tonight, um, because sometimes it takes me to, a little bit to do some research, um, I'll make sure to get your name um, and contact information, and I can get back to you on your question. So this is probably my favorite quote. Uh, so there are no gardening mistakes, only experiments. So if something goes wrong, it's not something that went wrong. It just wasn't quite what you hypothesized was going to happen. And that's, that's the beauty of, of gardening is the fact that we can, you know, have this opportunity to, uh, to make mistakes and it's okay. Well, and as I said, experiments, not mistakes. <laughs> Uh, so why don't we go ahead and start looking at different types of gardens. Um, as I mentioned, straw bale gardening. Uh, so this one is very unique because you take straw bales and hay bales um, and you can grow it and it's got that benefit of its raised. So it's at least, you know, about like two feet off the ground. So if you do have a harder time with gardening and getting lower, if you're doing an in-ground bed, this can be another unique option. Um, Keeping track of nutrients can be a little bit more difficult um, and you don't want to start with a fresh hay or straw bale um, simply because um, it, it hasn't broken down enough to have that proper organic matter that's going to help to feed these plants as they're growing. Uh, and it's just, it's a really fun, unique way that, um, you know, people have adapted to not being able to have the space that they have or say you don't really have great soil to grow your plants in, straw bale gardening is one of those options. 
square foot gardening. So I really enjoy this style of gardening. And actually when I do my garden beds this weekend, this is how I'm planning on planting. And so it's very much a systematic approach to gardening. Um, so each square you can have X a number of plants in them. Um, Obviously, the smaller the plant, more likely the more you can have in that square. Um, the larger the plant and more space you need. Uh, there's, you know, there's a couple different documents out there. Um, and at the end, I'll show you, you know, some websites that you can go to where you can find some of these documents that'll help you through these different gardening types. Uh, if you don't have a lot of space, but maybe you have like a small square. Square foot gardening is great because you can get the most out of that space of what you're looking to grow. Then you have container gardening. So this is, you know, taking gardening even to a smaller level. So say you only have a balcony or um, maybe, you know, you don't even have that or even a yard, say you live in an apartment building, you know, container gardening is something that could be feasible for you as well. Um, when it comes to container gardening, if you're doing things like tomatoes, um, you can see in here, and I'm gonna bring up my little pointer here. If I remember where my pointer is at. So um, you can see these five gallon pails right here. Those are usually pretty good for tomatoes because they're going to be deep enough for their roots to go. Uh, so, and they're going to get that height. Um, like most tomatoes and peppers and stuff, I know these ones right now don't have um, like a cage on them, but that might be something you want to consider doing um, even in a container to help keep it upright because as it starts forming that fruit, uh, you might have, you know, more tip over or, you know, getting it too close to that soil surface. And if it happens to be outside, well, then you have that chance of exposing it to, you know, bacteria, fungus, things like that, that, that live on that soil surface. So we'll go ahead and stop that spotlight. Then we have raised bed gardening. Uh, so this is something that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a slightly raised bed. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to work with, um, especially, you know, um, if you're newer to gardening, uh, it has a lot of areas that you can control. So you can control what soil you bring in. Um, so you know all those different factors that are going into your raised bed box. Uh, plus, if, you know, you do have a little bit of a harder time uh, getting around or, you know, like I said, getting down on the ground and weeding, you know, these boxes can be very beneficial. Um, and also, you know, you can build, you know, relatively any size box that fits your needs dependent on, you know, how much yard or where you're gardening. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have in-ground gardening. Uh, so, you know, this one is, you know, nicely laid out. They have, uh, you know, their trellis and stuff. Now, I'm not saying every new in-ground garden is going to look, you know, as, you know, nice and clear and free of weeds. Um, in fact, um, one of the places I used to live, I used to have a very heavy clay soil. So I would have had to use a raised bed garden. There would be no way I could do like an in-ground garden without, you know, doing some serious renovation to that soil. Uh, and generally, this is the one when people think of gardening, this is, this is what they think of. But I wanted to show you a lot of the other options first, because I know not everybody has that luxury of having that space of having, you know, a large scale garden. And that's okay. And if you are new to gardening, I'm going to suggest start small. So think big, but start small. Uh, you're especially, you know, if you're not sure how the varieties are going to do or what kind of weather we have. Um, you know, you might end up having an area where it floods all the time, so you might not have realized that. So you might have to actually move where your garden bed is at. So um, whether, you know, watch, you know, for as far as placement of any of these gardens is, you know, watch where that water goes and flows and, you know, do you have access to water? So say we have a very dry summer, um, 
you know, do you have um, access to your tools for weeding, things like that? You know, how far away, you know, is it from buildings? How much sunlight does it get? So, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that can go into gardening. And at first, you know, that first question you should ask yourself is, well, what do I want to plant in, in that garden? And then the next step you should think about is soil. So what is soil? Uh, I could do a whole lesson on soil alone. Uh, so I just wanted to throw some, you know, quick, fast facts at you as far as, you know, what soil is. Um, so when you're talking about soil, it's things like sand, silt, and clay. And these are all made from rocks that have been broken down over hundreds and hundreds of years to create the soil that we have. And, you know, to get that nice, you know, what people call, you know, that nice black dirt, you know, that, that darker color, that richer soil, um, having high organic matter is important, but actually that organic matter is only about 5% of, of that soil makeup which if you think about it, is just this very thin line. But organic matter is so important because that organic layer uh, mixed in with that topsoil is where you're gonna find a lot of your different nutrients. Um, if you know where your soil comes from and what's in your soil, that's gonna help you determine you know, how successful and productive your garden is gonna be. Uh, as you can see, we have so many different soil profiles across even just Wisconsin alone. Um, we happen to be in a very unique area since we're part of that drift list. And so we have, you know, a very unique soil profile versus, you know, those that are in those, those central sand plains. And so um, let's see, lacrosse is right here. So you can see we're made up of, you know, a lot of different like you know, silty soils, um, prairie silty soils, um, forested soils over sandstone. Um, and we have, you know, very old soil too, because it wasn't covered up with those glaciers when they came through. So some quick things um, of what you find in your soil. So you have those structural nutrients, which are your carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. And then you have those three primary nutrients, which is what you find on your fertilizer bag. So if you ever look at a fertilizer bag, it might say things like 10, 10, 10. So that means 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. So that's telling you the percentage in that bag of how much of that primary nutrient you can find. Now, the thing is, especially if you do live within the city, uh, you know, we tend to have a lot of overabundance of phosphorus and potassium, and these are the two that we want to watch out for. So if we are applying a fertilizer, it's important to know what our soil profile is, and we can do that by doing a soil test. And I'll talk about a soil test here in a moment, uh, but that can tell you, you know, how much phosphorus and potassium. And generally, when you do a soil test, it's going to give you a nitrogen recommendation. However, it is very difficult to actually test for nitrogen since, you know, there's nitrogen in the air, there's nitrogen in the soil. So actually getting a full nitrogen profile is very difficult. But we also know from, you know, science and research base that a lot of plants, you know, when they're establishing, especially like trees, might need that little extra boost of nitrogen when they're getting established. Uh, then you have secondary nutrients like calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Um, the one thing that people, I think, kind of forget about when they're having like plant issues, um, you know, as they're gardening, is those micronutrients. Um, so you have manganese, um, zinc, copper. So even if it's, you know, down just slightly, that can cause some really interesting effects on your plants and start like even changing them in color or how they grow so they end up having poor growth. So that's why having a soil test done is so important. And when you do a soil test, um, generally you wanna do that in early spring 
Now I know we're having a really weird year this year with everything going on with the pandemic. Um, I'm hoping that eventually when our extension office opens back up, we'll be able to continue to do our soil tests. I know our soils lab is going to be opening up in the next few weeks. So you don't necessarily have to go through the extension office to send the soil samples off to our lab. So you can do that yourself. Um, and at the end, I'll show you the website you can go to to get more information uh, on, on where you can do that. So as I said, um, a basic soil test that that'll look at your phosphorus, potassium, and another thing they'll look at is your pH level, so how acidic it is. Um, and so, for example, things like blueberries, they like more acidic soils. And I know that's one of the problems we have around here is, you know, we just don't have, um, you know, as much of an acidic soil in conditions for those blueberries to grow. Um, and I mentioned already that nitrogen recommendation, it's just based on what you're planting and, but is not, there's no way for to accurately test for it. So what do you need to test for your soil? Well, um, you can use a soil probe, or if you have a hand trowel or a hand shovel, that works just as well. You're gonna need a bucket to put all your soil samples in. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take, up to 10 samples or about two cups worth. And you're gonna wanna go in the area and do like several different samples of the area that you're looking to sample. And they don't have to be very big. So if you are looking at this soil um, probe right here, you know, you probably only wanna go up about six inches. Now with a hand trowel, you're probably gonna do a little bit more damage to the area. Um, but you know, just up to about halfway on here, take about 10 samples or until you get about two cups worth. Um, and you can get, um, when our extension office is open, you can get soil bags and on the bags, it shows you an exact line of, you know, how much to fill up your soil with. And then there's also a, a flat, uh, a, yeah, let me take a step back there. <laughs> There's a form you can fill out uh, that, you know, you can tell the lab exactly what you're trying to plant and what you're looking for. Um, now, there is a cost to the soil samples. So if you go and submit the soil sample yourself, it's generally $15 um, and then plus whatever for shipping. Um, if you go through the extension office, we charge 18, but that we ship it for you. So then that way you don't have to worry about you know, how heavy the box is and things like that. Uh, all of this then accumulates into a soil test report that they bring to you, that they, they send to you either in the mail or email, whatever you prefer. Um, I know sometimes it's nice to just have that hard copy versus an email. And what's nice is if you go through the extension office is we get a copy of it too. So say you lose your soil report somewhere in the mail, you know, you still have that option to come back to us and be like, hey, could you reprint my soil report for me? And we can definitely do that for you. And so they'll let you know, hey, you need X amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I know it's kind of hard to see at the bottom here, but it'll show you how, what your pH level is at and what your phosphorus and potassium levels are at. So in this case of this soil test, they're very high, so they really don't need it, need to add any more phosphorus and potassium. So problems your soil might have. Um, so you could have lead in the soil, which that is something that our soils labs can test for. Um, you know, your pH levels can be adjusted to a certain point. Um, you know, flooding can be a big issue. I talked about watching where your water flows. Um, you could have too much sand, too much clay, um, not enough organic matter. That's where things like compost can come in. Um, moisture retention, so how well it, it maintains water, and also compaction issues. So I'll go ahead, and I think there might have been a comment, Kathy? Yes, they're asking, would you do a different parts of the yard for a soil sample? Yeah, so if you're, if you're testing 
so if you're testing for your garden, I do 10 different samples where you're planning on putting your garden. If you're doing a lawn sample, I do 10 different samples around your yard. Um, if you wanted to see what your garden had versus what your yard have, I would have two different bags. So one that said yard and one that said garden. So that way, you know, you know exactly where that soil sampling is coming from. But yeah, you want to go kind of all around in that area. So good question. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. All right, so that leads into plant diseases. So we've talked a bit about different types of gardening. Um, we briefly touched on soil. Like I said, I could do a whole thing on that and maybe that's one of the things I do. Um, uh, and then there's plant diseases. So what is a plant disease? So basically, a plant can become sick due to infection by a variety of different types of organisms. So that could be things like insects, um, a fungus, you know, you have stuff like bacteria, virus, and nematodes. These are generally those five things that are going to be vectors that are going to cause, you know, some sort of disease and cause your plant to become sick. So, what can cause this perfect storm of a disease? Well, we have this thing what we call is the disease triangle. So you have environment, pathogen, and host plant. And if you don't have one of those three, then you don't have a disease. Now, it's very unlikely that, you know, we'll never have all three at once and have a perfect garden. So there's always that potential for disease because, you know, sometimes when it comes to a pathogen, there might be things out of your control. So an example of a disease um, is like cedar apple rust. And I do have that on my next slide. Um, unfortunately, that passes between junipers and like apple trees, like crab apple and regular apples, um, um, apples for consumption. And it's, it's a leaf disease, it's mostly cosmetic, but you'd have to get rid of all junipers, you know, within a certain square mileage of your house. And I don't know if your neighbors would appreciate you coming and, you know, knocking down their, their juniper plants and, and stuff like that. Um, do we have another comment or question, Kathy? We did, it's a, um, regarding the soil sample against, um, yeah. So if you do your front garden, you need one sample, and if you do a backyard garden, you need another sample. A raised bed, one sample, et cetera. So those three different spots you would send in. Yeah, I each. would, rec yep, yep. Each one I would send in for, for a soil sample for each, um, especially if you're planning on planting different things because they might have different requirements. So each of those would be a bag of like 10 samples or about two cups worth of soil from that specific area. Um, but yeah, that's another really good question. Um, so yeah, so um, back to the disease triangle then. Um, so you have that environment. So it, dependent on how closely you plant your plants, you know, they might not be getting a lot of airflow. And so that's why spacing plants is so important and thinking about how big your plant is by the time it's fully grown. Um, that's actually a good rule of thumb with landscaping too. So if you're looking at maybe redoing your landscape, you know, think about like the trees and shrubs you're planting and where are you planning on putting on your gardens because you might end up shading your garden or, um, you know, or it might get too much sun. It just kind of depends on, you know, where your garden is. Um, and then you have different pathogens. And those are the things that I talked about on the previous slide is with like the insect, the, um, you know, viruses, the bacteria, the fungus, and then host plants. So some pathogens have like two different host plants. So they'll have a secondary host plant. And those are things like cedar apple rust that I mentioned that are kind of difficult to get rid of. Um, you know, it, and honestly, when it comes to diseases, it's, it's that disease tolerance. So how, how willing, you know, and what is, what is that impact? And we'll talk a little bit later on of like how you can kind of troubleshoot some of these issues or, you know, keep an eye on things to, before they get to be too bad. 
So some different common diseases. Um, so you have uh, cedar apple rust. So that is just a, generally a pretty common leaf disease that you see on crab apples. They're these like little almost red dots with like a yellowing that are around it, um, spotty. And I mean, it, it makes your leaves not look very pretty, but generally it's only going to affect the leaves. Now, there's another disease that affects apples, which is called apple scab, and that can actually affect, you know, the apples on your trees. And that also does have some spotting on the leaves, but it looks very different than this. Um, I like this picture because it shows you the difference between downy mildew and powdery mildew. Um, which are both different types of fungus, but they act very, very differently. Um, so you have powdery mildew, which is exactly like its name. It looks like, you know, a powder. Uh, lilacs are pretty susceptible to powdery mildew. It's just because with generally with lilacs, they tend to get pretty bushy and, um, you know, th there's not a lot of airflow. And so then this fungus can form and you know, it likes that, that moist environment. Um, now downy mildew, is also a type of fungus, but unfortunately this is one that can start, you know, killing back branches and stuff like that. So that's one that you want to be a little bit more wary of, whereas powdery mildew is kind of cosmetic and doesn't do, you know, I mean it might make your leaves look ugly and, you know, you might see a little die back, but it's not going to be as extreme as with downy mildew. Um, this is probably one of my, uh, favorite diseases, and that's really weird to say favorite diseases, but this is aster yellows. Um, and it, it does this really odd thing where it's um, a, a type of, uh, is it, it's a phytoplasma. And so what it does is it causes like, you know, this is the flower right here, but it causes it to like turn green and almost look like leaves and stuff are coming out of the flower and there's really not much you can do except for removal of the plant. Um, this one back down here is a uh, black knot um, disease and it's a type of fungus that can take over um, the you know the, the branches. Um, this one affects primarily like your stone fruit so like cherries and plums and things like that. And so it'll look like this like dark, almost sooty mass. And by the time you see this, that's the second year growth of that fungus. And so what it looks like usually beforehand is this kind of green fuzz that almost blends in with the bark of the tree. So it can be very hard to spot the first year. And it's only within that second year. And I've had a few folks bring me in some branches and they're like, oh, what is this? And I'm like, well, it's pretty distinctive as far as what that disease does. Um, and what you wanna do with that is you wanna prune out those branches. And in between pruning out those branches, you wanna use um, a, uh, disinfectant with your tools between each branch cut because there's that potential of spreading that fungus from one limb to another and best time to really prune things is you know early spring or late fall um, with diseases though you might have to just get in there when you can um, just make sure it's not on like a hot warm day because that can also you know influence like you know further diseases coming in and then this one right here is anthracnose. Um, so anthracnose can, you know, it's a, it's a pretty common leaf disease. Um, this one does cause some dieback, so it can look very different. Um, anthracnose is also one of those that we might have to send down to the lab down in Madison with our plant disease pathologist for him to confirm. So for some things like, you know, aster yellows or black knot or even cedar apple rust, they're very distinctive. You know, they have those unique colorings. And so I'm able to help folks or my master gardeners are able to help folks, you know, with identifying those diseases. Other things we actually have to send um, samples down to the lab. Uh, looks like we had another comment or question, Kathy. Yes, we do. Um, do you re recommend thinning out lilacs if you see the mildew? Yeah, so um, in between, um, you know, when, it, when it's the proper time to prune, if you're seeing a lot of um, that, that powdery mildew, go ahead and thin out where it's kind of thicker. Um, and like I said, the best time to, to be pruning is that kind of March, April when it's still cool before buds start, you know, 
leafing out um, because there's also going to be less chance than that you're going to get a lot of sucker shoots, which I know can be pretty common with lilacs or even like crab apples. You know, you prune and then all of a sudden you got like three branches that just all of a sudden sprout from nowhere. And those tend to be very weak branches. So say a storm comes through, you know, they're not going to hold up as well as those stronger branches. And when it comes to things like pruning, and we can talk about that too at the end of this, is a little bit about pruning and, you know, proper times for that. And I can give you more direction. But yeah, go ahead and, and thin that out a little bit um, to open up that so that there's, there's more airflow going through. So now, disease or not a disease? <laughs> That is the question. So it's a very complex process to actually identify a disease, you know, because there's a lot of things that can be mistaken as a disease, but really aren't. So there's things like chlorosis, which is actually, you know, a nutrient deficiency, or maybe it's caused by girdling roots. So say a tree or shrub was planted too deeply, its roots are going to start circling around itself and essentially start choking it out. Um, so it's not getting the nutrients it needs. So then the leaves start yellowing. And then that's, that's essentially what chlorosis is, is the yellowing of the leaves. Um, and then you have a thing which is called tatters. And so this is where like the, and this happens a lot to oaks, um, where it looks like, you know, either insect damage or like a disease. Um, we don't know really what the cause of tatters is, but Generally, oak trees can kind of outgrow it, but those, those neural leaves kind of look like they've been chewed on. Um, and then you have a thing called maple gull, which looks like these like little almost like black tar um, on the bottom of like your maple leaves. Those are actually an insect that's, that's harboring there. And it's just, again, a cosmetic. It just causes, you know, these like dark spots underneath your maple leaves. And then herbicide damage. Um, I actually had something come like this come into the office. Um, somebody had several varieties of tomatoes and all varieties were exhibiting the exact same symptom as like, you know, those, those, um, you know, some of the newer leaves were like distorted and, you know, kind of discolored and like the older ones were just kind of dying off. And talking and working with our disease pathologist, Brian Huddleston, um, in Madison, um, he's just like, well, if it's all consistent across all varieties like that, I'm more apt to think it's herbicide damage, which dependent on, you know, what stage of growth that plant is, you know, a lot of plants can bounce back from herbicide damage, but it just all depends on what stage it's at and then, you know, how much herbicide it was exposed to. So then, now we go on to our pests. So like I said, it's a lot of information and we only have an hour, so feel free to ask questions as, as we continue along. Um, before I move on to pests, um, you know, I, I wanna kind of define that term pests because you know, you say pests, well, that could be an insect. You know, some people find weeds pests. You know, generally when we think pests though, it's more like insects or rodents. Um, like deer and rabbits can be considered pests. Um, and I know, you know, since we live pretty close to a lot of forested areas and I've seen several bunny rabbits in my yard, I definitely know I'm gonna have to probably put a, a, a rabbit fence around my um, garden beds because, you know, rabbits, they really enjoy what we grow. <laughs> Um, and this is what I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, so IPM, it stands for Integrated Pest Management. And it's basically the building blocks of how you can troubleshoot, you know, problems before they really become a problem. So the first step of that is, is recognizing what the problem is. So acknowledging, you know, what, what is the pest life cycle? You know, for insects, does it only have one generation? you know, per season, or does it have multiple generations per season? You know, behavior, is it one of those things that like, it's a general grazer, so it might come through, eat some of your leaves, but it'll leave most of the plant alone? Or will it come through and totally decimate the plant? Uh, Japanese beetle, for example, I know can be very um, obnoxious and can come through and, you know, do a lot of damage, not just to our fruits and vegetables we grow, but to our trees and shrubs. Um, 
and then like uh interactions you know is there you know what kind of what is your tolerance with that pest you know is it something that you know like okay is this something that you know i can live with and that kind of gets into that decision making tool okay so i maybe only grow these fruits and vegetables for me and my family so if we lose some it's not going to be a big deal um, but maybe some of you grow your fruits and vegetables or flowers and sell them at the farmer's market. You know, any loss can be a very, you know, economic injury to you. Um, you know, are you going through and are you monitoring your garden? So, you know, some people, I know their style of gardening is they plant, <laughs> they set, they forget, and they come back at the end of the season and they're like, all right, what do I have? And for others, you know, people are in there every day, you know, they're making sure they're weeding and, you know, keeping that spacing. And, and that's the thing about gardening is it's, it's very forgiving. So if you don't get it quite in that first year, it's okay. Try again, you know, try different methods, you know, figure out what works for you. And then once you've realized, okay, I need to do something about this pest. Then there's a couple of tools in your tool belt that you can use. So you have biological controls. So say you have something like aphids, you could bring in ladybugs. So ladybugs are really good about eating aphids. Now, you know, it takes a lot of aphids to really do a lot of damage to a lot of plants. So maybe that's something that you don't really need to bring in, but maybe your plants are affected by aphids every year. Um, you know, cultural controls. So those are things that I was talking about with, you know, making sure you're spacing things out properly or you're monitoring or you're looking things. Um, mechanical controls. So um, say you're not big on using chemicals, so sometimes it might require like actual hand removal. So I know of people, they're like, oh, you know, I just send the grandkids with the bucket of dish soap water to go through and they just drop those Japanese beetles right in and then we're good to go. Um, and then, you know, there are some folks that rely on chemicals. And if you are using chemicals, it's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as you're applying chemicals um, according to the label and applying it in a way that it's beneficial to you and your garden and the folks around you, you know, as long as you're following that label to a T, you should be okay to use chemicals. Um, and, you know, there's, there's organic chemicals out there. I know that's a scary word for some, the, the word chemical. Um, you know, it makes people think of like, you know, hydrochloric acid and things like that, you know, that are like, you know, super dangerous. Um, but there, there is a time and a place when chemicals can be used. So common pests. So, um, there's our wonderful, beautiful Japanese beetle. Um, sometimes people get mistaken with um, the Japanese beetle with the multicolored lady Asian beetle, which are the ones that look like ladybugs but aren't and stink up your vacuums and your homes and invade them in the fall or summer or whenever they can get in. And those things are annoying. Um, and then you have things like the rose chafer. Um, which, you know, I've probably seen more cases of rose chafer. Japanese beetle for the lacrosse area seems to be relatively new in the last 10 years. You know, it's, it's starting to, to come through more. Um, and then you have things like aphids, or in this case, um, you have white grubs. Now, white grubs could be the, you know, the young of the Japanese beetle, or in this case, this is a main June bee larva. Um, and then you have the four-lined plant bug, which these ones can be very difficult to see, but their damage, you know, is very distinct as well. Um, and it looked like we had another comment or question. We do. Um, oh. What about planting combinations for pest control? Yeah, I think that's a very good um, way of opportunity of using that cultural control is, you know, using plants that maybe detract from um, you know, certain insects, so they're not going to draw them in. Um, if you're using things such as traps, um, I'm going to warn you now, if you're going to have a trap for your Japanese beetles, make sure you're doing it away from your neighbor's garden, otherwise your neighbor's not going to be very happy with you. Because, <laughs> yes, it goes away from your garden, but then if that trap's near their garden, then those Japanese beetles are like, oh, well, I'm just going to go over here and munch on all their plants then. And so, 
traps can be beneficial, but they're only as beneficial as often as you use it. Same with the companion planting. You know, if you're planting certain things because they detract from certain insects or pests, um, you know, and even planting certain things together can even help with weed control too, because, you know, you're limiting, you know, the amount of space that those weeds can come. Um, do we have another? We do. Which is the one that lives on soil beans? Soil beans. Um, can you elaborate on your question a little bit? Pull up the chat box here. Yes. Oh, soybeans. Oh, um, so yeah, so which is the one that lives on soybeans? So yeah, so there's um, nematodes, certain nematodes that cause cysts on soybeans. Um, I'm trying to remember the specific name. Uh, tell you what, Barbara, I will look that up before we're done here. Like um, once we're completely done, I'll, I'll stop the recording. Um, right as we get to the end of questions and then I can look that up real quick for you. Um, I can't remember it is, but it, yeah, it causes cysts and stuff like that. But there's also beneficial nematodes and stuff like that that can live on the soil. But yeah, there's, there's a certain one that's not really great for soybeans that, you know, a lot of people worry about. So we'll go ahead and go on. So then that brings us to weeds, um, which, you know, some of you probably recognize the picture that's behind here. So um, I have it up here again. Um, this is Creeping Charlie. Um, I have also up here buckthorn, crabgrass, uh, purslane, um, and then, uh, oh, what is it? Pennycress. So, um, they're all very unique ones. We see them quite a lot. Buckthorn a lot in our forested areas. Um, it's pretty invasive and a lot of folks, you know, if they do have forested land, work on trying to eradicate that just because it tends to choke out, um, you know, other beneficial plants, but it also is a host to a lot of like diseases too. So it's a secondary host. So it might not show any symptoms, but it'll give other plants that certain disease um, that happen to be nearby. Um, I get a lot of questions about Creeping Charlie, um, especially like organic means of control of Creeping Charlie. Um, one is just, you know, looking at where those shaded areas are, because Creeping Charlie really enjoys shaded areas that are cooler. So if that's where you're generally seeing them, um, maybe finding a grass seed or other plants that prefer that cooler shaded area and that'll help choke out that creeping Charlie. Otherwise, um, you're not going to like this, but hand pulling, um, you know, if you pull them up so often, you know, for so long, eventually it will go ahead and you know, that root system will have a harder time with establishment, especially as, as you're pulling it up, you're getting other things established in that area. Um, uh, same with uh, crabgrass. Now there's crabgrass and there's quackgrass. Um, I tried to find a good picture of comparison, um, but there wasn't one that I really liked, but a lot of people use crabgrass and quackgrass interchangeably, but they're actually two very different style of weed grasses. Um, and I'll tell you this, I have, I struggle a bit with identifying grass weeds because a lot of them look very similar to a lot of the grasses that we plant, like Kentucky bluegrass or fescues and things like that. And so then a lot of them kind of hide in plain sight. Um, but we have a lot of specialists that I work with down um, in Madison that have helped me with identification. So that's another thing that extension can help you with is if you're looking to ID certain weeds or flowers or plants and things like that, we will try to help you to the best of our ability. Now, it's always easier if we have a flower or an older plant to look at. Some younger plants are a little bit easier to identify. Like purslane is pretty unique. You know, you can, you can tell it's purslane. Um, 
I could joke is kind of like that. Um, there's a video out there. It's like you can tell it's a birch because of the way that it is. Well, you know, you can tell purslane is purslane because of the way that it is. Um, I mean, and buckthorn is, you know, pretty distinctive as well. Um, was there another question? We actually have two questions. Okay, go um, for it. One, one person's asking, I know that the one in the lower corner is edible. Is Creeping Charlie? Um, I am not sure on the edibility. Um, and I, I say this with a lot of plants, you know, I get questions like that is like, can I eat this? Um, I do the research and identification, but I don't, I don't have that personal knowledge or even that research knowledge to know what is edible. Um, so I usually err in the, the side of caution and saying, you know, maybe not eat it um, or maybe, you know, looking for professional foragers. Um, professional foragers are out there, so maybe looking for one of them and they might be able to tell you what is edible. Um, same when it comes to like insects and stuff, like sometimes I'll have folks come in with insects that, you know, are like ticks and, you know, or uh, bird mites, you know, I'm, I'm not professionally diagnosed. I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not able to like say from a bite, you know, oh, it's this. But if you give me a sample of something, um, like, you know, if you actually have the tick, you know, we can send it in for identification. Um, or if you have examples of the bird mites, which, you know, are very, very hard to see, they're almost microscopic you know, we can send those down to our entomologist and he can help to ID them. So I can't tell you 100% for sure to go ahead and eat Creeping Charlie. <laughs> so um, long story short is, I guess, err on the side of caution and, and don't eat it. <laughs> All right, the other question is, does the Japanese beetle leave the leaf looking like lace? Netting to deter the beetle from establishing. Once I noticed them last year on pole beans, there were too many to pick off. I tried spraying soapy water on the leaves, organic chemical solution you know of. Um, I mean, neem oil is one that comes to mind. So it's an organic um, oil that you can spray. Now with Japanese beetles, it's hard because in order to really control them, you also have to control their larva, which are the white grubs in your lawn. And you can start noticing if you have a higher population of white grubs, if you have moles that move in too, because generally that's what they're going after. Or if you have things like raccoons that are digging up like your flower beds and things like that generally they're going after those white grubs um, and there are certain things that you can apply to your lawn um, we do have public publications out there that talk about control and monitoring for Japanese beetles um, so um, at the very end um, once I turn off the recording um, I'll just get your um, name and then I'll go ahead and I'll send you that publication because I should have everybody's emails if you registered for this. And so then I can email you that publication. All right. So I'm going to launch two polls. So the before we get into questions, um, just to one is just kind of asking, you know, oh, you know, did you did you learn something new? Um, and then, you know, are you going to utilize anything that, you know, you learned? And then the second one um, is a demographic survey. Um, and that's just for reporting purposes, you know, because since I'm part of UW-Madison, they want to make sure we're, you know, reaching um, all, um, everybody and we're having equal opportunity. Um, and that is anonymous and there is a prefer not to answer. So if you're not uh, comfortable with taking a demographic survey, you can go ahead and click that. So I'll launch um, the second poll. And then after that one is done, um, I'll launch the, the demographics. And I won't go ahead and show these ones. These ones are more for, um, you know, my knowledge for, for future meetings and um, to improve. All right, I'm gonna end that poll. And then I'm gonna 
launch um, the third poll then? We're actually doing pretty okay on time. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll. All right, so is there any last minute questions? Um, otherwise, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording and then we can take more questions. And then, you know, that way, you know, if, if there was something you wanted to know and you wanted to get on the mic and ask, feel free. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.